We're getting into a new series. I know last week we took a bit of a, a breather from Exodus. Um, strap back in, we're in again. And this is actually a series all around worship. It's called I Worship. It's going to be a short one, um, just three weeks. And we're going to be taking a look at the tabernacle in Exodus. God gives instructions as to what his house in the wilderness should look like. And as we look at it, I want you to know that the tabernacle in this moment was going to be the central place of Israel's worship for the next 440 years before the temple in Jerusalem would be constructed by Solomon. And I believe that as God set out the instructions of what the tabernacle should look like, it's going to tell us something about what God has to say about how we should worship, how we should interact with him. He never does anything by mistake. He is speaking to us. And so we're going to be looking today specifically at one element in the tabernacle. Throughout the series, we're going to take look, a look at different elements in the tabernacle and what they're saying to us. And the one we're going to look at today is the Ark of the Covenant. It was an important piece of furniture in the house. I know some guys are like, Dunks, are you telling me we are going into a, some cosmic interior design series? I've got enough of that at home, on the home channel. I know those shows, they're rubbish. I don't like them too. But let me tell you, God is speaking through the furniture in his house. Why don't I pray, and then we'll get into it. Father God, just as we sang about your presence, knowing that your presence changes everything, it's my prayer right now that in these next few minutes that we get to share together that this would not just be simply a meeting, that this wouldn't just be a speaker and an audience, this wouldn't just be a talk. Lord, that's not going to do anyone any actual good. But knowing that your presence is here, knowing that you are specially present here as we gather as your people and we gather around your word and your truth, Lord, I pray that it would do something supernatural in the hearts of every single one of us. We want to put your truth above everything. We want it to be the loudest voice in our lives. And so as we look to your word, as we sit in your presence, Lord, would you be made much of in this place? Would you say what you want to say to us? Would we put right what we need to put right? Would we put away what you're calling us to put away? And Lord, would you be glorified in us as a community? And everybody said, amen. Furniture is a weird thing. You might not like dealing with furniture, choosing furniture, any sort of design. It might not interest you at all. But it's funny because furniture can tell you a lot about someone. If you go to someone's house and take a look at how it is furnished, it actually can tell you a lot about them. Without ever having meeting them, ever speaking to them, you can tell what's important to them. You can tell what's maybe not important to them. The reasons why this is here and that is here is, is important. I was reminded um, of a time where I needed to actually furnish. And it's that moment when you move out of your parents' house, you buy your own place, and now you realize you actually don't have anything. And uh, I remember moving out of my parents' house and basically all I had at that time, I actually uh, I moved into a place that I had bought. It's the same place we live in now, but uh, a place I had bought. And, and moving there, I was gonna have a roommate, which was Josh, who is in a, a drummer in our band. And um, between the two of us, I had a bed, I had a side table, I had a desk, and I had a camping chair. Josh didn't even have a bed. Literally, when we moved stuff from my mom's house to my house, we actually kind of stole a single mattress on the way. And for about a month, Josh slept on that single mattress just on the floor um, before he made a plan. That's literally all it was. The first night uh, in our house together, we had moved everything in. Uh, first night, we had dinner, which, and by dinner, I mean KFC. We had KFC sitting on the floor literally on the carpet because there was nothing else and we had a camping chair but only one and we didn't want to be the guy sitting in the camping chair while the other guys on the floor it was just weird and in the next few weeks we got to add some stuff which was helpful but I remember on that first day the very first thing I bought uh, I had walked randomly into game and there was this special on a tv stand 
I didn't even have a TV, but I bought this TV stand. It was a good deal. And so we spent the first night eating KFC on the floor and putting together this TV stand. It was one of those flat pack ones where you literally have to do all the work and pay all the money for it. And so we built this thing from scratch. And we put this thing, and I loved this TV stand. I really did. It was, it was an amazing piece of furniture in my life. It was the first one I had bought for my house. And in the next few weeks, we began to add things. But it's two single guys. We were dating our now wives at the time, but we were not married guys, so you have to understand it was a bachelor pad. And so we got the TV and we got the PlayStation because that's how it had to go. And if you had walked in, you would very quickly realize these are just some young single oaks living in this place. Um, there are no women that live here. And, um, and then came the time when me and Nikita got engaged, and then we were about two weeks from our wedding, and Josh um, got the boot because Nikita was coming in. And uh, I remember after honeymoon coming back, first day that Nikita moved in, that this was now gonna become her house too, it was like a fire sale. Everything had to go. She just started to point at stuff. I was trying to sell it on Gumtree. She was giving it away. Anybody who would come into And you know what hurt me? The very first thing she went after was my TV stand. You can see what it did. I'm still damaged. She looked at this TV stand and said, no, bro. Not in my house, not in my name. That thing's ugly, get it out. And she secretly had known, because she had already like planned with grandparents that one of our wedding presents would be a TV stand. So she already had this thing pre-planned. But it hurt my soul, because suddenly everything was gone and now it looked different. And then actually a few weeks later, Josh and, and Holly, who is now his wife, came and visited. And they looked around and laughed, because they were like, there is nothing here that is left of the old. It is all new. But it's nice, because we love that ladies bring in things that smell good. And there was color coordination now. And we actually had like a color palette that just never existed before. But we know that when you walk into a place, there's a lot you can tell by the furniture, by, by the thought that, or lack of thought, that's gone into what's in the building. And God here is talking about his house in the wilderness. It was a tabernacle, it was a tent. And he gives instructions to Israel and says, this is what my house will look like. This is what should go here and there. And as he does this, he is, and God's super good at doing this. He's amazing at doing this. He's very good at taking earthly things and using them to help communicate heavenly realities. And so he can take something as simple as a piece of furniture, something natural, and say, hey, here's a supernatural truth I want you to get. God's so good at this. And I believe we need to take notice when God does this. So we're going to be in Exodus 25. Let me set the scene for us in the first two verses and just bring in this connection to worship because I don't want us to miss it in the midst of a worship series. Verse 1 says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution from me. God is doing something new, and that thing is going to center on worship. God is putting together his house. He's giving instructions as to what his house should look like and what it should be made of. But in that moment, he includes the people and says, you will actually contribute to this. Because God was saying, hey, my house will be the central place of worship for you. So I'm going to base this whole thing. I'm going to build everything on worship. Bring in a contribution. Let's get the people involved. I'm going to jump down to verse 8. It says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. This chapter, God, in 20, Exodus 25, speaks about the furnishings of the tabernacle. And then from chapters 26 to 30, he gives very clear instruction on, on how it should be constructed. He gives dimensions, what materials need to be used, what needs to go where. He even speaks about the priests who would be working in the tabernacle and how they were to enter and exit, what they even had to wear and the duties that they would actually be performing. And it's crazy that God goes into so much detail. He gives five chapters dedicated just to tell Israel this is how it's going to be. And I don't want you to miss this because when it comes to God, intention matters. 
He doesn't do anything by mistake. And so when he's dedicated five chapters of instruction, I believe he's trying to say something to Israel, and I believe he's trying to say something to us. And we need to pay attention. Let's take a look, just kind of brief overview of the tabernacle. This is a picture of, of what it, it may have looked like. I know some people sometimes are like, I didn't, I didn't think it would look like that, but that gives you an idea. It was actually 45 meters long, about 22 uh, meters wide, and it basically had three main areas. We're going to put up a floor plan where you actually see there's, there's an outer court which had the uh, altars and the, ba the water basin. Then there's an inner court where actually the tabernacle was, and it's split in two pieces. The one piece is where all of the priestly things kind of happened. It housed the table. It it housed the altar of incense. It housed the lampstand. And then behind a big veiled curtain, you had the most holy place, right there in the middle. And in that, there was only the Ark of the Covenant. And these three areas are important because God is actually communicating two things. There is a growing and a deepening intensity in proximity, but also in intimacy. And the whole point of the outer court was preparation. That's why you see offering and cleansing. It was preparation for the move inside. And then you get to the inner court, the inner part of the tabernacle where you now have the priestly offerings. You had the table where there would be an offering of bread. You had the altar of incense where there would be an incense offering. And then you had the lampstand where there would be an offering of oil. And then behind the curtain you had the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place, in the Holy of Holies. No one went in there. Only once a year, the high priest would go in and, uh, and make an offering. That was the place. And in all of this, we actually find its culmination. God actually calls this his sanctuary. He uses that word sanctuary. And I, and I want to quickly just speak about his intention in that. Because sanctuary actually derives from a Hebrew word, which means to be made holy. God's intention behind all of this was that he was trying to show that, hey, I can clean, I can purify your brokenness. I can bring you in close. I can bring the proximity uh, in, in close. I can actually bring you into a place of intimacy with me because I am holy and I want you to be holy like I am holy. That was his intention. And this all gives a picture of what would actually culminate in Jesus. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that phrase, dwelt among us, is actually translated from the Old Testament word tabernacle. Jesus actually, in, in, in essence, is our tabernacle. He made his tabernacle with us. He dwelt among us. We'll take a look at the, at the ark quickly. This is what it looked like. God actually gives about 12 verses in its instruction and in how it should be um, constructed. And the, the Hebrew word actually meant chest. It was to be made of acacia wood. It was about 1.2 meters long, about half a meter wide, half a meter in height, to give you an idea of proportion. It would be covered in the purest of gold inside and outside. And inside, they would place the stone tablets that Moses had received from God up on the mountain when he gave him the law. And it was covered with a lid, and the lid was called the cover of atonement. And on top of the lid, there was two angels that were fashioned out of gold, and they were facing towards the center with their wings upward. But what I want you to see in all of this, in the tabernacle and how it's laid out, in the, in the actual Ark of the Covenant and how it's constructed and decorated, there is so much symbolism, and there's so much that God is saying. But for me, the most important thing, the main point of all of it, and it's actually what I want to speak more about today, is God's presence. We sang about it just now. The whole point of the tabernacle was that it would be the place where God's presence would move with Israel. The whole point of the Ark of the Covenant was it was going to be the seat that, the, that God's presence would sit on. It actually says this in Exodus 25, verse 21. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the seat, mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you. We're talking about worship. 
We're talking about the central place of Israel's worship. But when we're talking about worship, everything actually hinges on God's presence. So I know that this is going to be a preach on the Ark of the Covenant, but if it's okay with you, I'm not going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant again until the end. Is that okay? I want to focus in on this idea of God's presence because I believe it's what the whole point is. It's, I believe it's what is going to help us understand what God is saying to us through the tabernacle and his ark. There's three things I want to talk about with God's presence. Number one is this, God's presence moves. I don't want us to miss it. When you look at Israel's experience of God's presence and then you look at our experience today of God's presence, you can see it's different. For Israel... God only met with Moses. He was the only one who spoke with God, met with God. The people didn't. For us today, we know that every single one of us have access to God. We can meet with Him. We can speak to Him. In the Old Testament, Israel, the idea of God's presence was always attached to a geographical place. He was in a bush, or He was up a mountain, or He was in a temple. But we know today that actually God's presence and His Spirit dwells among us, dwells within us. And so you can look at the two experiences and be like, this seems very different. And sometimes it can lead you down a road where you ask the question, well, did the plan change? Was God like, hey, listen, I've tried it this way with Israel, it didn't work, let me change course, let me adapt. The answer is no, because I want you to see the move of God's presence. I'm going to take you through the move of God's presence through a little biblical history journey. I'm going to start right back in the Garden of Eden. God's presence was, was with him. God's presence was with Adam. He walked with him. He had intimacy. He was in close relationship. But something gets in the way. There's a truth statement I want to put on the table as we begin, because I believe everything builds from it, and I believe everything is going to actually build to it. This is the truth statement. I believe that the desire and intention of God had always and will always be to dwell with people. The desire and intention of God had always and will always be to dwell with people. For me, the plan didn't change. The plan just got a bit mixed up and God had to move it back. Because we know what happened in the garden. Sin entered. The fall of man happened. And sin brought with it all that sin does bring with it, which is damage and destruction and distance. Because when we're talking about the, God, uh, the presence of God, we're talking about holy presence. Sin is not holy. And so now there is a break in proximity. There is a break in intimacy. There is actually now distance that has been placed. Sin always attaches a restriction and a limitation but God, in his desire, is that he would dwell with us. And so in his grace and mercy, he puts in a plan that says, hey, I'm going to draw you near. I'm going to bring you back. We're going to get back to that place of proximity. We're going to get back to that place of intimacy. Every time, I'm going to take you through the run, kind of through biblical history. And I want you to take note of the distance. Take note of what's going on because you're going to see God in action. I'll start with Moses and the burning bush. That's at the beginning of Exodus. God meets with Moses. He actually is present in a bush that is burning but is not consumed. And he speaks only to Moses. But it's out in the wilderness, out in the desert. We don't even know where it was. It was away from everybody. There was distance still there. He then moves to Exodus 19 where the presence of God lands on a mountain, Mount Sinai, as he was giving Moses the law. And so Moses is up on the mountain meeting with God in the cloud. But now we see the people of Israel gathered at the foot of the mountain. And that's where they worship from. There's still distance, but something's changed. We then move into a tent. As they moved through the wilderness, Moses had a tent, what was called a tent of meeting. We're going to see it um, just now. But it was outside their camp. It followed along, but it never came within the camp. Then God gives instruction for the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was different because the tabernacle was now actually going to be in the center of the camp. Do you see what God is doing? It wasn't just Moses anymore because now the tabernacle was going to have priests that had duties and work to do. They got closer into the presence. 
then moves to a temple, an actual building, which was on Temple Mount in the middle of Jerusalem, the holy city. And so now you have the presence of God surrounded by a large city right in the middle. And then Jesus arrives, and it culminates in him because he says, this temple is made of bricks, and I'm going to take it down because I'm here. We saw in John chapter, chapter 1, he will dwell among us. And so he comes as God himself and presents, him, presents his himself with us. And then he dies and rises again and he ascends to heaven. And then what does he do? He sends us his spirit, the very presence of God. And where does it now dwell? In the heart of man. It dwells within us. When we are in relationship with Jesus, when we have faith in Jesus, the, God, the presence of God, the Spirit of God will be present in your very heart. We went from distance. God talking to Moses out in the wilderness where no one knew to his presence actually being within a human heart. Do you see how God moves in his presence? Do you see the plan of God that when we're far off, he has a plan to draw us near? Do you see that when there's limitation and restriction that's been placed in the way, God gets it out of the way? God's presence moves. Number two is God's presence models. We're looking at the instructions for the tabernacle, but in Exodus 35, it actually only gets built there. That's where it gets constructed. So the now moment for Israel, where they found themselves in this moment, was the presence of God would actually fall on a tent, the tent of meet, meeting we spoke about. It was outside the camp. Anybody could go and seek God there. That was where Moses would meet with God. It says this in Exodus 33, in verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Verse 9 says, When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. God was giving Israel, in the midst of instructing them what the house of God would look like for them going forward, he was giving them a picture of what worship could look like, how they could interact with him, how they could approach him. And there's two things I believe that are, are shown here in this Exodus chapter 33. But I believe it's two things that God is shouting at us. And this, he's saying, this is how you can worship me. The first one is this. Worship where you are, wherever you are. There's two positions in this chapter that matter. One is geographic, and the other is a heart position. Geographically, we can see the distance. It uses this phrase that the tent was far off from the camp. But also, anybody could seek God there. Anybody, anybody could go and meet with God there. But it was only when Moses went out to the tent of meeting that the cloud would descend and that God would meet with him. And so geographically, you can see, see it in the picture. The nation of Israel would stand at the entrance of their tent, and watch Moses far off meeting with God. There was geographic distance, but there was also a heart distance. Imagine being the Israelite right now standing at your tent door, watching this all happen, being someone that is actually wanting and desiring and seeking God. But when you go to that tent, the, the cloud doesn't descend. It only happens with him. You would think in that moment, Israel would say, you know what, we're distant. There's a relational distance here and we can't get over it. But I love what the people do. Standing at the entrance of their tent, while Moses goes in to meet with God, they begin to worship. And they worship right there, at the entrance of their tent. And you know what I believe it says to us today? We need to worship even when we're not in the room. I don't know if that's been something you've experienced. I don't know if that's your experience right now. I know there have been times 
when I felt like I wasn't in the room, where I felt like there was distance, both geographically and in heart. Hey, God, you're far away. I'm standing here in my situation at my tent. I'm watching everybody else meet with you. I'm watching the cloud descend for everybody else, but you're not doing that with me. It's a moment where you feel very alone. It's a moment where worship might be the furthest thing, might be the, 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 the one thing in the world you don't want to do. The people of Israel are showing us here that even in that moment, even not being in the room, we're going to stand and worship anyway. Worship where you are, wherever you are. I love a song that Ben Hastings wrote. It's called Highlands. And the chorus says, I will praise you on the mountain, and I will praise you when the mountain is in my way. God's calling us to worship wherever we are. Second thing I'm seeing here and that I believe God is saying through this passage is come boldly. Verse 11 says, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. In the time of wilderness, in the time of distance, in the time of uncertainty and fear and doubt, God is giving Israel a picture of what worship can be of what it could look like to interact with me and actually what his desire is for each and every one of us. That we would approach him, that we would speak to him as a friend speaks to a friend. You know when you have a close friend, when you have a true friend, how you're going to approach them. You know that you are going to approach them with no fear of rejection. You're going to approach them with no fear of judgment. The conversation is going to be real and authentic and raw. And so when you go to a friend like that, you go one way, you go boldly. And God is saying, come to me boldly. Moses walked in, the cloud would descend, and he spoke to God like a friend speaks to a friend. That's what he's saying. This might be a little sidebar, but just as I was preparing this, I felt like God wanted to say this. And I'm going to say it all day. It might just be for one person the whole day. When we're talking about talking, getting real, showing someone who you really are, speaking like a friend to a friend, I know for many of us, that's actually very difficult. Because when we have to show who we really are, there is a lot of fear there. There is a lot of baggage there. And we get really, really good at putting out our projected self the person we let everyone else see, even the people who we are close to. I don't know who needs to hear this, but can I tell you that God loves you? Not the projected you. God loves you. The real, authentic, when you're alone at home, alone at night, in your bed. That person, that you, is the one God loves. And that is the person who God is seeking a worshipful, intimate, and real relationship with. And can I tell you, if you come boldly like he is asking you to, if you can do that with this relationship, I believe God will help you do that with these relationships so that the projective self can die and you can approach people in real and authentic and raw ways. There's nothing quite like having a moment where things are not going so great and being able to actually bear it all with someone. None none of the fluff, none of the bows on top, just bear it all and actually have someone in it with you. Can I tell you, God wants you to come boldly to him and then he will help you in other relationships do the same. Come boldly. After spending time with God, speaking as a friend, Moses would often come back from that meeting with his face shining with the glory of God. And he didn't actually realize that often he would walk in and and the people would react because they couldn't handle it. They were overwhelmed by this glory that was just shining from his face. It was actually just a reflection of God's glory. It was a reflection of the time he had spent. It was a reflection of worship. I don't think we, we get this enough. 
that actually our personal worship does have even a passive effect on others around us. We get caught up in what we say and what we do. Can I tell you, if we can get the personal worship, the time we spend with God alone right, when you walk into a room, you don't need to say or do anything, the room will change just because you're there. Because you're actually reflecting, sometimes unintentionally, the presence of God. So often, though, we get it wrong because we then make our worship experience, we make our personal worship relationship just that, personal. It's between me and God. It's private. Can I tell you, if it passively will affect others, I believe God's desire is that it is going to actively affect others too. In my heart of hearts, I believe that the fuel for mission, the outward action of God, is actually based in worship. If we can get that right, it's not just this inward thing. It's not just, oh, it's me and God. Oh, I had a great time with God. It's, I had a great time with God, but let me tell you, I've got some stuff to do. I've got some conversations to have. I've got some things to do. As I was looking at Moses and his face and how it shone, I was reminded of another face that shone with the glory of God, not because it was reflecting it, but because it was actually it. And so that takes me to point number three, God's presence mandates. Mark chapter nine, verse two says, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them. It's a Greek word, metamorpho, and it gets translated in English as the transfiguration or being transfigured. It was a moment where the glory of God shone from Jesus' face, where his clothes became radiant and white, where he actually would show his full deity in the midst of his humanity. He was fully God and fully man. And most scholars agree that this was an account, a moment where he, had, he got to turn up the intensity of his divinity so that he could show, give his disciples a little taste of his glory. He shone. It continues in verse 4 and says this, And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Are you seeing these connections between Exodus 33 and Mark chapter 9? I love that the cloud descended. I love that Moses is there. I love that he is talking with Jesus like a friend. Thousands of years after the wilderness, it was still true. And I don't want you to miss the significance and the symbolism of what was going on here. You have Elijah show up and he represents the prophets because the prophets in the Old Testament had, had prophesied that the Messiah would come. Moses is there representing the law, saying, hey, the Messiah is actually going to fulfill the law that we couldn't. Jesus stands there as the Messiah who has come, and God the Father speaks out of the cloud and said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And you have Peter, James, and John, disciples of Jesus, and they're invited there for one reason, and it's to witness. When we witness, it will always lead to a response. I'm going to take you back to that truth statement that I spoke about earlier. The desire and intention of God had always and will always be to dwell with people. Do you see how he was dwelling with these people, even in this moment? The plan hadn't changed. The plan didn't change with us. It is simply in the process of being realized because the presence is not distant or far or in a geographic place. The presence of God is actually available to you and me to be present in our very hearts. It was always the plan. We've just got to watch it unfold. I'm going to end off by taking us back to the Ark of the Covenant. I told you I'd come back. Because I believe the four things we see here in Mark chapter 9 are four things we see so powerfully in the ark. And it's going to tie a bow on it. The four things are the law, prophecy, Messiah, 
and witness. The law, number one. The Ark of the Covenant was also known as the Ark of the Testimony. And the testimony was the stone tablets that Moses had received from God, where God with his very own finger had written out the law and given it to his people. And what the law was there to do was to set a bar, to say, hey, if you're going to go the way of salvation, if you're going to go the way of closing the proximity and coming into intimacy with me, this is what you're going to have to do on your own. This is what you're going to have to do and this is what you're going to have to not do. This is your way to holiness. This is your way to righteousness. And just like Israel, what we find very quickly is that in a broken and fallen world and the imperfect self that we have, we fall way short. It's a bar we simply can't get to. But God doesn't leave us there. Why? Because his desire and intention is to dwell with us. And so he enacts a plan. And we get into prophecy, because that distance, that limitation, that restriction that is brought by not reaching that bar is now met by the grace of God, where he puts in a plan to rescue and redeem us. And so uh, he prophesies a Messiah will come, and that Messiah will actually cover over your sin, cover over your lack, cover over your failure. And it's why you have an ark that contains the law, that contained the bar that we could not reach. But a Messiah would come, and the Messiah would cover over it. And it's why you have a lid, and the lid is called the, <laughs> the cover of atonement. A Messiah would come and would be the ultimate sacrifice so that the law could be fulfilled. And it was shown to Israel in the tabernacle because there would be one day a year and it was called the day of atonement and it would be the day the one day where the high priest was able to go into the holy of holies and what he would do is take the lamb uh, take the blood of a spotless lamb and sprinkle it over the ark sprinkle it over the cover of atonement that cover was showing that when atonement comes it covers over our failure but that sacrifice was temporary. It had to happen once a year to cover the sin of the people. God had a better sacrifice in mind, and it was his only son. It would be a sacrifice once and for all. Romans 3.25 says this, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. But it doesn't end there. It ends with witness, and I don't want us to miss it. I'm going to take you back to Exodus 25. Verse 22, there I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. God says to Moses, from the mercy seat, from on top of the ark, I'm actually going to tell you and Israel what to do. For us today, that mercy seat now has Jesus sitting on it. Because he was the one who atoned for us. He was the one who covered over the law for us so that we are not in the, the state and, and, the, and the weight of the law, but we're actually sitting under the law of Christ. And it's from that place, from that mercy seat, that just like God told Israel and Moses what to do, Jesus tells us what to do. Jesus has a mandate, and it's for each and every one of us. As the band joins me on stage, I said that I believe that worship is the fuel for mission. Jesus has a mission. Jesus has a message. Jesus has a mandate. And if he is the one sitting on the mercy seat, it now actually becomes ours. And so there is going to be stuff for us to do. See, because for Israel, the ark brought mercy and grace and presence and peace. Where do we get that from? We get that from Jesus. And so Jesus actually becomes our ark. He is the one who brings us his mercy, his grace, his peace, his message, his presence, his spirit. My question for us today is if Jesus has a mandate 
if he has a mission, if he has a message and sitting on that seat, he gives it to us, who can you be an ark to this week? Who in your life, who in your family, in your friends, who on the street can you bring the message of mercy and grace and peace? Because Jesus was our ark. He brought us all of that. We now become arcs of the new covenant. And we get to offer, offer that to people who are in desperate need of it. But it all centers on the presence of God. It all is birthed out of the presence of God. It was always his desire. It was always his intention that he would dwell with us. It was never meant to be distant. It was always meant to be proximate and intimate. It's why he wants to take up residence in a human heart. The word says that he's closer to us than our very breath. And that should do something in us as we take up his mandate. Would you stand with me?